Rock. The Rock Pile Report. The pettiest, hardest drinking Bills podcast. Coming to you from the South Towns in Buffalo, New York. It's the Rock Pile Report. Drew with a chest cold. Can't do the wind up, but we are here in studio with Anthony Prohaska of Cover One. It's uh, it's a great night to be alive. I still have a little bit of voice, but I'm going to have to, like, we're doing two hours of podcasts. I'm going to try to save what I can. Um, awesome. Anthony Prohaska of Cover One is here in studio with us. Anthony, he set a delicious beverage down in front of you and literally yelled at you Correct. that you weren't allowed to touch it until we started. Why don't you go pick that thing up and tell me what's in it? I was going to say, so, like, I was, the first thing I was going to say is, am I allowed to drink this now? <laughs> Thank you so much. Yeah. Th- thanks, Chris. Because well, we gotta get, we gotta get your reaction on camera to how that drinks. Ooh, Ooh. I like it. What's in it? What is it? <laughs> well, I'm watching. Drew. I know. I noticed that. I just uh, let it rock. That is. I like to call that a Georgia old fashioned. So it is. I use Ragged Branch bottled and bond weeded bourbon and uh, bits of Andre Risen in it. Maybe. <laughs> Maybe, and uh, it's got pecan syrup and peach bitters. Ooh. It's delicious. I like it very much. Well done. It's almost as good as the ice. <laughs> <laughs> Anthony, cheers. Cheers. Thank you for having me. Always a pleasure to have you in the studio. And I felt like you were the perfect person to have this conversation with because I know that you nerd out over the X's and O's of football. <laughs> I, and, da- I dabble. And I think that over the... Over the course of all this draft discourse, there's been a, there's been some finer points and some schematic specific things that have been kind of lost in the shuffle of all the discourse currently going on. So I want to touch on a few of those ideas and get your reactions to them, kind of give you what I think, and I want to go over some of these. Because I still think that for the average fan who's looking at this, there's things that they're missing, or maybe the Bills are tipping their hands, not just with the draft pick, but also the makeup of the roster around those. Mm. So some of the things that we're concerned about maybe aren't such glaring concerns. You're just not seeing it the right way. And I just want to bounce some of these ideas I've had off you. Okay. So the first one is a player that I know you like coming out of the draft, Ray Davis. Mm. Now, you just did a show with Bruce Nolan, mm. kind of going over all of the draft picks. What was your the consensus for the two of you on Ray Davis? I hope Bruce watches this so I can lie and be like, Bruce is super upset because there was no running back in the first round, and he thinks that's where all running backs should be taken. Um, it was a – Bruce and I were both in the, in the same spot of like, cool, running back in the fourth round. Who cares what his age is? He's not going to get a second contract anyway. But the pairing with James Cook is something that I really liked in terms of what Ray Davis does. I think he's a good – and I, and I said this on the show, and I feel like this is – I think this is an accurate comp, but one that probably doesn't get fans too excited – I really feel like he's a combination of, like, Zach Moss and Devin Singletary, but maybe, like, a little faster. And he just does everything at an above-average level. And he gives you some pop. He gives you some strength. He gives you some downhill ability. Can pass protect a little bit. Needs to clean up some things there, but is a good receiver on third down as well. What I like is when you're 5'8 and 211, you're basically a fire hydrant with legs. That's fair. And, like, it gives me... Now, obviously, the agility might not be the same, but it reminds me of this concept of like Maurice Jones Drew. He's got so much more shake though. And he's he's got and that's where the Singletary comp comes in for me cuz Devin Sing, Devin Singletary I thought was just like above average at most things, which was fine, but he wasn't like a plus matchup in any piece, but he could shake some dudes. He had that like make you miss in a phone booth type of agility at times. Ray Davis has that. He's got some jukes where he literally is like breaking dudes ankles. He's got one where There's some trash at the line of scrimmage. He hops over it, and as he hops over it, the safety's coming down, and as soon as he lands on the ground, plants his foot and shakes and just crosses up the safety and then houses it. And you you take his skill set, pairing it with James Cook, I think he's he's a nice guy to have that sets you up to kind of do a little bit of everything, but in a different way. So his comp is, uh, his WCW comp would be like Ice Train. (laughs) I like that a lot. Yeah. Well done. Well done. Uh, well I done. you guys. <laughs> Damn it. This is the wrestling podcast. Okay, you made a mistake. I was like, I don't know why like, you should have thought of this. I yeah. I, I see. I've tried. I always think I'm prepared no. and I always get caught just flat footed whenever it's like I as soon as I see Chris's eyes light up, though, it's like a tell. I'm like, oh, no, there's something coming. 
Yeah, 100%. My, my Keon Coleman comp is a fantastic one that I have for a wrestling related. Chris will get a good kick oh, out of it. Boy. And I know you will too. Because you want, do you want to just stop and just talk wrestling? Because I know you like that more. Should we just do that? <laughs> did you watch Backlash over the weekend? You want to do the chant that the French did for AJ Styles? Talk about talk about dynamite last night. I I would rather the elite taking over. I would rather pull my lower lip over my own face. That's <laughs> oh, what that's I. Would. Fair enough. I, fair enough. So when you look at the makeup of the running back room going into the season, you've got a guy in Ty Johnson who's kind of got a. He's like a less explosive version, I think, of what he's got a little more north south to his game than James Cook. Yes, but at the same time, he does a lot of the same things the same way. If you're talking about. The mm. type of size build, like mm. what you want from them. He's not exactly a power back. You wouldn't. He's like he, a cross between James <clears throat> Cook and Latavius Murray, ironically, from last year. Like he kind of does a little. He's a little bit bigger, but a little bit faster, but a little bit slower, but can still yeah. catch out of the backfield, but can still pass protect and win in some short he's yardage. Quick, not fast, yes. but at the same time, it's like all these weird things that he is. So he's yeah. this blended thing. Then there's Ray Davis, who's your power back. Mm de facto if you look at the makeup of the roster also a good receiver out of the backfield good receiver don't lose that and then there's james cook who is kind of lightning in a bottle in the right blocking situation Mm. and this is where i want to talk to you about schematics so last year like he showed that a lot of his most explosive plays came out of zone blocking situations Mm. at the same time cook ran the second most gap runs in the nfl now, I think that kind of skews towards what the Bills were doing. Mm. You know, they, they were a gap-blocking offensive line. Now, you may have – do you have the splits on that? No, I was saying then just from a percentage standpoint, the Bills, uh, 46% gap to 53% zone last year. Mm-hmm. That 46% in gap was the third most in the NFL. So I have in today's – it's skewing a little bit because of – the larger trends in the NFL, but most teams are zone dominant. So to have close to like a 50, 50 split, almost like you did here yeah. for gap and zone is a significant piece. And so that speaks to the, what the bills were doing. And I think that it's interesting when you look at the fact that like, okay, so now you've got James cook, you've identified the fact that you've built a line that can run gap concepts more than most teams. Mm. And a lot of that I think is because you have a Spencer Brown, Mm-hmm. And when he's effective, you can run these mm-hmm. when he's paired up with a Su- Osiris Torrance. Mm. And when you have decent center play, mm. all of a sudden you can run a little bit more power. You can run a little bit more inside. You can do some more gap things mm-hmm. that you want to do. Mm. And, I mean, really, I-, I think that that's the underrated value of Deion Dawkins is that he can do both. Mm. Now, he's ne- you're never going to look at him as the most dominant run-blocking left tackle mm. or the most dominant pass-protecting left tackle. Yeah, But he's still good at he's very effective in a multitude of areas he may not be the best but he's like he's like an eight out of ten or seven and seven point five out of ten for like a very lot of things for and, very many things that's not grand weird. and then you look at the way that they brought in david edwards mm. who last year limited sample size but he was awesome. the most effective blocker in both zone and gap I was hoping, yeah. at guard <laughs> of any interior offense and he was so he had it so much in those sixth offensive lineman sets he crushed it so the concept is they bring him back. Yeah. You've got a Cedric Van Praan, who Granger, who they're going to kind of groom as a backup's backup, and then over time maybe see where it goes, because you still have a guy in Lyle Collins who can play a couple different spots. Mm. You've got depth. <clears throat> but the idea is you built a starting five that look on paper like they could be really effective running these gap schemes, which isn't that prevalent in the NFL. Mm. And then you go, like... I, I see Ray Davis, mm. guy, doubled his gap to zone ratio in 2023. Mm. He ran 67 zone snaps to 127 gap, which tells you Ray Davis is really good at this one thing that, oh, wait, the Bills happen to have this type of blocking scheme, and they seem to be kind of steering into that. But only 51 missed tackles forced, which kind of speaks to his running style, but it also tells you, like, okay, if we're going to be a power football team, we need a back like that, mm. where he's not looking to make you miss. He's just going to hit you. <laughs> he's going to load up behind his pads. He's going to play the game with a little more physicality. I like the addition. Do you think that, like, all of these things, if I'm reading this properly, we're probably going to see them maybe flirt with leading the NFL in gap? Oh, that's a good question. <laughs> I mean, yeah, you see, you see what they did last year being – third in the league at that 46 percent i think you could 100 percent put them in that category potentially leading it in gap i I really think it'll come down to i I think it'll be a lot of what we saw last year even with dorsey but then going with brady in the back half of the year 
they really kind of went with whatever scheme worked for them. Early on, they went with a lot of duo, which counts as a gap run scheme, even though it's it kind of plays out like inside zone a little bit. Yeah. Um, and then all the tackle wrap stuff down the stretch with Spencer Brown and Deion Dawkins. If anybody watched the Bills Cowboys game, they just basically ran that play like every single friggin' time. <laughs> and it's like you're playing a game of Madden. I used to have one. It was the it was the year that the it was Madden. Oh, was it oh seven? Either Madden oh seven or oh eight where it was Mark Bulger, Torrey Holt, and Steven Jackson. Oh, wow. All on the same team. Nice pull. And I had them in fantasy football. Nice. So I started playing with them in Madden, and what I realized was Steven Jackson got juiced so well in terms of his, his speed, but his ability to break tackles. He could catch, he could do everything. I could I could start off on my own 20-yard line, and I could run halfback slam every single time, and you could I could tell you it's coming. You can't stop me from getting four yards of carry, and I will go four yards at a time down the entire field, run an entire quarter out of my hand. We'll play this game in eight minutes because the clock's never going to stop, and I'm going to win. Yeah, exactly. Seven nothing. And that was the, f- like, it's it's like if you can do that as a real team, like we saw them do that to the Cowboys. Yes. That's what the game turned into. It's it, just, hey, we have a play. You can't stop it. All right, we'll see you in hell. It was ridiculous. <laughs> yeah, we'll see you in hell. We'll see you in hell. Where we have your soul. And it was, I also put... It was a credit to the Bills in that game. I was so pissed at Dallas for not adjusting because we watched other teams adjust to it and figure it out and try to slow it down a little bit. But to the Bills' credit, yeah, they used that, and then we saw a little more. Is anyone shocked they went out in the first round again? (gasps) Yeah, no, not really. And maybe a little bit because that Packers team came in limping, but then Jordan Love looked like the truth. And then that that Packers defense was also built to lose to a team like the Cowboys, and they just, man, I did wild what happens to them every single friggin year um <laughs> it but couldn't happen to a nicer group of human no, beings jerry jones is such a class act i know he got <laughs> well what is he he's all in and glory holes and he's got a million Yikes. like quotables and none of it amounts to anything on the never, field never except for those stupid super bowls in the 90s and <laughs> god damn him and then you look at what they did like against the chargers the night before christmas eve where they're just running weak side zone like left and right they're they're bringing Sherfield in that in that motion and it's the, like the same play they're just running it to the right and they just run it to the left they bring Sherfield in jet motion they run it to the left they run it to the right that's it and they have the ability to spam zone schemes and those are just small examples of a zone and gap but like they have the ability to spam either one now to your point that's a different offensive line that existed last year with McGovern at left guard, with Mitch Morse at center. Part of the reason you're able to do so many of those things is because for as much as maligned as he may be in pass pro sometimes and being undersized, Mitch Morse was so heady and so smart and so great in a lot of ways, and he allowed you to function in both of those worlds. Mm-hmm. And we'll see if they can still do that this year with McGovern and Edwards because that's a different that's a different type of athleticism combination at center and left guard versus Morse and McGovern. It's a yep. different type of frame and style mm-hmm. So I, I think that's a fair question to ask. Like, what are they going to look like in terms of their gap versus zone? I really think it's going to be they can just flip a switch depending on the opponent they play. But they're not going to be like a 70% zone team. Like, you're going to see a lot of prevalence in those gap schemes because of their running backs, their offensive line, and something that we were talking about offline, just how a lot of NFL defenses are built now. NFL defense is because of the trends you saw in these offensive booms the last, you know, five, six, seven years – NFL defenses became built to stop zone runs. They started having interior defensive linemen that were built to get upfield, penetrate, get after the quarterback. And they started to swing the pendulum in their favor. And then combining that recently with a lot of too high coverages and all this stuff. So if you're an offense, how do you swing the pendulum back? Stop running zone stuff. Run it down their throat. Run it right at them. They don't have numbers in the box. They want to play too high coverages. We're going to take your soul and run it down your friggin' throat, play after play with a variety of gap schemes. And we're going to people move you. Because you're built for speed and penetration, and we've kind of corrected some things to be based with power. And and you and you add that with Osiris Torrance last year, who's a people mover every sing, in every sense of the word. Dawkins can do that. Brown can do that with his athleticism. And it's also it's a bit of you know zig when the, everybody else is kind of zagging type of thing. It almost takes me back to a day when I heard some some guy, Chris. The guy liked feet. Oh, what was God. his name? Oh, remember a guy Rex Ryan who said he was going to build a bully. Mm-hmm. Well, the funny thing is the Bills kind of quietly did it with their running game last year. We had a thousand yard running back for the first time in a long time. They were that was a huge piece of the offense that was like lost in the conversation of yeah. what's going on with Diggs and oh look at Kincaid and oh Gabe Davis sucks and all this and that. Lost in all that was 
the Bills are the entire year, not even including Josh Allen runs and scrambles, which significantly skew like the EPA. They had a top five run game in EPA per carry yeah. the entire year. Mm. They were up there with like the Lions and the Ravens, these teams that are tremendous offensively from a schematic Because they're one of the few teams in the NFL who kind of like the Chiefs can feast on you by saying, look, we know that you're going to sell out to stop our quarterback. Yeah. So we can take advantage of you. And it doesn't matter. Like, there's nothing you can do because if you do crowd the box, it's suicide. Yeah. You're never going to do it. So you as a defender, you as Vic Fangio are just going to sit there and let it happen. Yeah, you have to you have to pick which you way you want to die. You just let it happen. And then you just hope that if, if you're if you're the defense, you're hoping that you can capitalize on some Allen turnovers or some inefficiency. Wait, or... You mean like getting three of them in one game and somehow still losing it? Oh, man. <laughs> man. <laughs> um, man. Miami... I don't know, for as much smack as that fan base talks, I don't know that they'll ever live down the concept that they had three Josh Allen turnovers, two of them in the red zone, and somehow did not win that game. With all the injuries the Bills had and everything, I mean, the Jets were able to do it with friggin' Zach Wilson in week one, but the, man, it's just so... <laughs> this off, this offseason in general, the more and more I've been like in this game, or in the industry, as you like to say, like the more I just hate every fan base in every way shape and form like just the amount of stupid crap that comes out of everybody and like the shit that everyone it makes me you know what like the dolphins van talking shit it makes me think of you ever seen bring it on yeah when the football players are making fun of the guy cheerleaders and making fun of jan they're like jan jan he's and then he's like dude you guys just lost and they're like oh yeah shit. he's like shut your mouth yeah it's like you like and that's why like mm. even like the cheerleaders they're like you're making fun of us like we win all these trophies like you guys suck and then, and then, but then, Miami, <laughs> Miami come, Miami fans come back, and it's like, yeah, but like, puh, 1972, undefeated Super Bowl. It's like you weren't that. That was so. It's like Maple Leafs fans being like, yeah, look at all the cups we got. The last cup you had, there were three teams in the NHL. My favorite is the uh, Dolphins fans who point to we were the number one offense in the NFL last year. God, what happened in the playoffs? Oh, and and even that, like, I'm I, sorry, I understand whether and certain elements are a detriment to certain teams, and you kind of have like an unfair luck of the draw. D- can, I, can I kind of voice a hot take here? Absolutely. I don't think it's weather. I think what happens is that everything Mike McDaniels puts in, all the wrinkles he designs, everything that he comes up with that's new, because you have to, you kind of have to tweak and reinvent all the things oh, you've done because they're already on tape. Yeah. And professionals have already broken them down. By the time it's not the fact that they can't play in the cold. It's not the fact that it's winter time. Everybody catches up by the time the season. It's is. by the time the season gets to crunch time. Everyone has figured out Mike McDaniel, and Mike McDaniel is so such a smart guy that he can't get out of his own way, mm. which is run the ball, man. And yet you won't commit. They win the game in Buffalo here two years ago if they just commit to running. The I thought that's half. what they were going to do in Week 18 last year. They I was run, like, they win that game if they run the ball in the second half. They drafted another running back. Why? Yeah. Why are you drafting another running back that you're just going to sit on the bench in crunch time because all you're going to do is try to throw passes to Mike Gesicki? A chans like e- I-, I wish I remember. Now they think John U. Smith is their savior. Oh, oh good. D- Devon A chans like EPA per carry last year was like double everyone else like he had a ridiculous year and at first it was because of the sample size because he was hurt and he busted off some big runs it just kept happening like Miami's running but but see that's another point too like the tie in with what the Bills have you need to be multifaceted even yes. if you have that quarterback the, the the Bengals ran into it with having Burrow then all of a sudden their offense took off because they started running the ball more and they started to stop getting predictable out of gun versus under center which is a whole other piece, you have to you have to live in both worlds because yep. you can't just come in and, well, we're just going to be pure spread passing. We're going to be, you know, pure power run, whatever. You have to be able, you need to be able to access almost everything on the menu and yep. just turn the page as necessary. And the Bills have that, which is a sneaky thing going into this year of how prevalent, like, the run game can be. Now, you made a comment earlier how you're sick and tired of uh, fan bases and fans <laughs> and just idiots. <clears throat> Nothing has been more polarizing this offseason than the wide receiver room of the Buffalo Bills. Oof. Your friends, uh, Aaron and Greg. So I said, I was like, oh, your friends. Our Chris, friends. Chris picked that up. I was like, your friends. Over there, I, w- I, w- I waited for the pause. And then, <laughs> that's why I just stared at you. I was like, I'm just going to stare back. Your friends, uh, Aaron and Greg, um, they just did a show this past week where they talked about how the they flo- Greg floated the idea oh, yeah, of the yeah, Bills yeah. having the worst wide receiver group in the NFL. And 
there's some discourse around that, and our own fan base is very hyperbolic about the idea. They're hyperbolic and militant. Militant, <laughs> because the wide receiver train derailed and crashed and killed a lot of people oh, on geez. draft night. Like, there was casualties. Like that train in, uh, oh, what's the movie with Samuel L. Jackson as Mr. Glass, and he der- uh, Unbreakable, <laughs> and he derails that train to try and find Bruce Willis. <laughs> yeah, that train. Well, so this is the idea that I've had in the aftermath of all of this. Mm. Schematically, you want to talk about wide receivers. Mm. Here's Greg talking about how we have one of the worst wide receiver rooms in the NFL, and that you'd be hard pressed to find another team that would take our wide receiver room over theirs. On paper, sure. yeah. Well, yeah, on paper, one hundred percent. Which I would have thought it would be like bef- pr- prior to the draft. I'm like, oh, it's kind of maybe the Patriots, but then after getting Polk and Baker, it's a little different. Sorry. You have the fans screaming about how we're not doing enough, and why aren't we being more aggressive, and how come this, and how come that, and where it takes me back to in my head is last off season. When Chris and I sat here making fun of Brandon Bean, remember the drop where it's like, hey, Brandon. <laughs> how dumb do you think I am? How dumb do you think I am? It's Will Ferrell screaming. Yeah. yeah. Um, when they were talking about linebacker and how there was veteran free agent linebackers galore on the market who yeah. were going for $1.9 million in a one-year deal, and the Bills weren't even bringing them in for visits. And we're just like, what are you talking about? You just invoked the name Balin Specter as your st- potential starting linebacker. What are we doing here? Huh? What we didn't know is they had a plan. They kind of knew, just based on what they had seen, that Terrell Bernard was probably going to be the guy. Hmm. And then, sight unseen, with no preseason action, they gave him the job. And we were all just waiting for the other shooter, going, okay. I also think, like, maybe Tyrell Dotson had a chance, and then he played, ironically, he played himself out. With his preseason play because he got all the snaps. And Terrell Bernard went on to give us Pro Bowl caliber play Mm. at middle linebacker at a position where we genuinely believed the sky was falling. Mm. So having experienced this once before. Well, let's uh, throw that out there. Terrell Bernard, 2001 AJ Styles with WCW right before they got sold. Wow. WWE didn't know what they had. And TNA took it. I like that. So Terrell Bernard is TNA AJ Styles. Yeah, I like that. Right now. I love that comp. That's tremendous. Well done. You get that. You're a huge TNA and Ring of Honor guy. You remember AJ and Ring of Honor? Hey, whoa, 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 whoa. I am a huge fan of TNA. I just think we're talking about I knew you were going to flip that. (laughs) I knew you were going to flip that. As soon as I said it, I was like, damn it. Well done. Fair enough. Touche. So so with that said, (laughs) last week I made a joke. You? And I made a joke, it was tongue-in-cheek, about how the Bills could be the only team in the AFC to primarily run 13 personnel. Mm. And that was a kind of a knock on Keon. It was me making fun of Keon Coleman and his lack of speed. Keon Coleman is, is the Jade Cargill of the NFL. You get that, Chris? Tons of Got athleticism, it. tons of upside. Just a little raw, just needs some polish. You know about Jade Cargill. You're a huge women's wrestling guy. Yeah, you, you, got, you called me. Yeah. Uh, did, did, does he wear sequined pants? or? Does it's a she. It's a she. She's a okay. woman. See, great. <laughs> Wonderful. Okay. Great. You know, don't act like you don't know. Like you're not watching all of like this. Like I'm not watching all of this. Yeah. You're just people in spandex throwing yeah. themselves around. Yeah. No, I do enough of that. It's on Sunday. I was going to say, that's just a regular yeah, weekend just day for a regular you. regular Sunday. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not going to pay to watch what I already do in my living room. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so here's, here's the idea. Like, can you think, first of all, teams that have gone heavy when it comes to what, what's the last team that you can think of that actually tried to run a 13 or 14 personnel package? Can you even think of one off the top of your head? Kansas City used it in 2022, a decent chunk, and then some in 2023, oh, 13. Oh, and then uh, Packers did some at Rodgers' last year. Eagle, no, Eagles is more 12. Yeah, you have to think hard. You have to think really Maybe, hard to Ra- find a team. Ravens do stuff like that, but I don't count the Ravens because their offense like almost doesn't count because of everything they do with Lamar and all the linemen and, and everything. When you look at the talent that the Bills have put on hand, mm-hmm. I made the joke, and then I had to revisit the joke because I'm like, wait a minute, there might actually be something here, and I need you guys as the listeners to follow me here. Mm. Everybody's screaming about how the Bills haven't done enough to find this high-end pass catcher, this elite option who can create separation, who's going to be our alpha, and who's our de facto wide receiver number one. I want to explain to you the makeup of the room right now in case you haven't noticed. Right now, we're... Like, 
we are the like farthest extremes in terms of size, weight, and skill set mm. that exist in the NFL right now as a mm. wide receiver as a wide receiver room. Not including Dalton Kincaid. Not including yeah, Dalton. Purely Kincaid. wide receiver. G- purely wide receivers. They're heading into camp with four players at the top of the depth chart who are all over six feet tall and over 200 Say pounds. who are six, eight or, and above. Well, hang on. Four who are under six foot and under 200. Shakir, Samuel, Isabella, and Ham- Hamler. Mm. Small, quick. I mean, Shakir has probably the best intermediate skill set of the group mm-hmm. because he can get open downfield. He can, mm-hmm. he can work against coverage in the intermediate mm-hmm. area of the field. Mm-hmm. The rest of these guys, Samuel, Isabella, and Hamler, like if you were to put them on the field for you on offense – you're probably expecting them to get open sometime in the first five yards downfield. And it's usually by design Mm. or it's by finding a soft spot in whatever the zone is. Mm. So five to seven is where I expect those guys to get targeted because the farther you go down, you saw it with us trying to throw deep to Hardy last year. Going deeper down the field to short targets, it almost, you're putting yourself at a disadvantage for no reason. You the the throw has to be super on point because there's no there's less of a chance of a contested catch or a ball winning situation. Yes, and so with that in mind, you've got this mix of speed, shiftiness, returnability, and mm. like short aerial receiving talent. These guys are going to be satellite targets, mm. and then Shakir, like I said, he's kind of the outlier. We don't know what his role is going to be. Mm. I don't know what his ceiling is yet. Mm. Nobody does, because last year he took such a monumental step forward when he started seeing more targets. Mm. Once Brady took over, it I mean, it's crazy. He set the record for the highest reception percentage. Yeah, and his EPA was, like, super high. It, some of his numbers are still obviously skewed by the sample size because yes. it wasn't as prevalent or their volume wasn't there like it was for other guys. But his production and the plays that he made relative to the production were absolutely tremendous. And then... You look at the screen game and you think to yourself, mm. Brady tried it a ton and it just didn't get any traction last year. He mm. was trying it with digs. Also, with that, we Allen. So I just want to touch on that quick. Like part of the screen game, Allen piece, struggles with that. So it's not just. I mean, I feel like, and it, I understand where it comes from. Like a lot of people Do you remember think, his like, rookie year when he overthrew a wide open. Run? Dude, but see, that's it. Like it's. <laughs> I think people think it's so straightforward and easy, just like throw a screen. It takes timing. It takes like trajectory and pace on the ball, like what you're doing with your eyes and your body language. Also, it's it's obviously impacted by what the rush is doing. And when you have a mobile quarterback, defensive linemen aren't just selling out trying to come forward. Allen Mm. isn't a good screen ball thrower, whether it's like running back screens out of the backfield or it's like tunnel screens or smoke screens. Like and if if Brady can correct that, man, that'd be wild. So the thing I want to point out is outside of these smaller wide receivers, even though you might not think these guys are talented, there is one clear trend that stands out to me. I want to run through these guys with you. Let's go down the roster. Mm-hmm. Quintus Cephas, six and a half RAS score. He's a slow wide receiver, mm. right? He ran like a four seven. Yeah, not great at the at the combine, but a very physical play style. Very physical. Also loves to bet on himself. Loves to bet. <laughs> <laughs> All right, up top. <laughs> so, so you have this here where Quintus Cephas has a, like a lot of intensity as a run blocker. Like that's probably one of the things that really intensity as a run blocker, vertical threat with run after the catch. Chris, I think we just lost the headphones. Yeah, but I'm, I can still hear you. Yeah. All right. I'm taking them off. So then you have Chase Claypool. Oh man. 9.9 RAS, might be one of the biggest horse's asses in the NFL. Not great. Big wide receiver. Yeah. Decent speed is a vertical threat, yeah. but really suspect route running. Like, he, he's lazy with it. Like, when you watch him run his routes, he's not clean. He's not polished. He doesn't do any of it well. And I think his understanding of, like, where to be in a zone concept, mm. I, I just don't think he ever found it. Yeah. And that's why he hasn't found success. At the same time... He is an A plus run blocker, mm. and he can give you some special teams. Yeah, sure. <laughs> Mac Hollins, mm. wide receiver with average speed, mm-hmm. but size. size at six foot four, two hundred and something pounds. Mm-hmm. Special teams ability, mm-hmm. pretty good run blocker. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Keon Coleman, mm. eight point one RAS score. Jade Cargo, big wide receiver, below average straight line speed. At the same time, play speed is very quick. Mm-hmm. 
very physical. Mm-hmm. Like there's a like one of my favorite highlights of his isn't even a play where he got the ball. It's the game against Flo- it's Florida State, Florida. Oh, where he buries the 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 slot corner. He like, late comes in the game. off the ball and just bullies a guy who he <laughs> and knows, is, and then but he knows this guy's thirty pounds lighter than him. Yeah. And he just buries him and takes. He he enjoys it. it takes pleasure in it. That's the thing that makes a good blocker. Mm. Like if you ask an offensive lineman, like now Cyrus Quanjo never amounted to much in the NFL, but it mm. it's one of the quotes that I think like should resonate with people when you think about what do I want in an offensive lineman. Mm. Cyrus Quanjo said, he goes, my favorite thing about the game, like playing the NFL, playing the game of football is I get to take another human being against their will. And it's like, that's creepy, but also like, that's the intensity you have. That's to like play. the Ray Lewis quote too. When somebody asked him like, what are you trying to do on like each play? And his like response was like, oh, I'm trying to like take like the offensive soul. Oh yeah. And you're I just want like, them, what? I, I want them dead. Yeah. What? What? This is just a game, man. And so to see that Coleman has some of that dog in him. Yeah. I like that. A very physical run blocker. Absolutely. Justin Shorter, 7.9 RAS score. Big body wide receiver with uh-huh. average speed. Nothing crazy, but he's large catch radius, contested catch ability, all those nice things. Very physical player. Mm. Gunner on punts. Like, if yes. he's healthy, he's, he's your probably your starting gunner. Yeah, he'll make an impact. Or at least teams. he's fighting for that job yeah. in training camp. You'd want him to compete there. And if you have to put him on the field... Run blocker, mm. against, especially against smaller DBs. Oh, yeah. Tyrell Shavers <laughs> only got a four rest score. He's not a good athlete whatsoever. But dude is six foot four, mm. 215 pounds, mm. plays with a little physicality. Mm. So every single one of them has an under 1.6 second 10 yard split. Which is good. Which speaks to their explosion in a short area. Mm-hmm. Power. Five of them, right, are all six foot four and over 220 or over 215 pounds. For being slow, mm. the RAS scores are actually pretty decent, which is because all of their the, their 40 times are all being balanced out by, and the agility drill stuff gets balanced out by the explosion drill. Yeah, and the size and frame and what they're able to do with their explosion at that size and frame and weight. None of them are quick. But they're all described as intermediate to deep threats in the passing game. Because of the power and explosion that they have in their steps and movement and what that Which can do. Which gives you this idea that all of a sudden, like, and then just physicality in spades. Yeah. I think about this and I say, okay, you guys are all doing the mental gymnastics to try to figure out, well, who's going to be the one who absorbs all these targets and who does all these things now that Diggs and Gabe Davis are gone? The sky is falling. <laughs> what if the plan is... You know, as we just talked about running more gap mm. and how you're going to bully some football teams with the fact that you can run the football and you can do it in a variety of ways. Mm. What if the concept is it's like, look, we understand that that might have to be more of the offense than it used to be. And we saw flashes of it last year, specifically in that Cowboys game. Mm. Who's to say they don't look at the landscape and Brandon Bean says, look, we could try to we could try to move things around and get a T. Higgins. We could try to get a Debo Samuel. We could try to. We could try to do a lot of things. Yeah. Brady, what do you think? Yeah. Do you have the ability to zig when everybody else is zagging? And Brady goes, well, what we could do is we could rely on the power of the offense and then just build a, wi- a cheap wide receiver core full of guys that nobody's really prioritizing because all they are are mashers. Mm. Mashers and contested ball catchers. Mm. But they can give you plus run blocking. Mm. They can set you up for a really good screen game if your quarterback can learn how to throw it. Mm. And at the same time, you're talking about a team that will have the big wide receivers that if you allow them to get separation, if you don't press everyone at the line of scrimmage and slow them down, mm. if they're open in the intermediate area of the field, you got to hope your safeties can bring them down mm. if you're a defensive coordinator. Mm. I think that you're almost going to see the Bills, like this is the linebacker thing where it's like, they had a plan for this. They said, mm. listen, Daquan Jones, we have these things. We, we have things in place that we think will we make these things. We have think we've made certain things available yeah. to us that we think will allow a, a cheap pivot to still be successful. Mm. Right now you're watching them play this position cheap. You can question why, but at the same time, maybe they have a plan and maybe it's this idea that more running, more running will be more effective if all of your wide receivers 
like you said, a power spread offense where mm. every one of the guys that they're going to put out there is a potato masher. They just get out there mm. and smash these smaller cornerbacks mm-hmm. that have become prevalent in the NFL because I, I know that everyone likes the length on the outside. Mm-hmm. On the inside, you see you want guys who are quick, the Teron Johnsons of the world. Yeah, the Mike Hiltons, Kenny Moores, guys like that. And Teron Johnson plays his position with a lot of physicality, but how yes. well is Teron Johnson going to do trying to run block or trying to run defend against a six foot four wide receiver. Yeah, it's a different element. It's a whole different game. Yeah. And so with that in mind, I think everybody's looking at this at least a, a little bit you you They're looking at it from the wrong side or the wrong angle. Yes. You're you're trying to figure out who's gonna be the alpha. What if that's not the thing that keys the offense? It's still gonna be the quarterback, right? Like Chris, you're never gonna take Josh Allen out of the game. Josh Allen's going to still in clutch moments. You're going to need him to make passes, and they're going to have plays designed to go to specific receivers. They have they'll have a package of plays drawn up for it. At the same time, there's going to be giant chunks of games where I expect we're going to see a football team that relies on the physicality of everybody mm. to move the football. Whether it's Josh, whether it's Ray Davis, whether it's these guys paving the way in a zone blocking in the zone blocking scheme. For James Cook. Mm. And James Cook is going to have a 145-yard, two-touchdown game. Now, everyone's complained, who has him in fantasy, complains about his lack of touchdowns. Mm. Some of that's goal line work, but also some of that's that he hasn't broken any long ones. Mm. Really? Well, if you get him better blocking on the outside immediately, Mm. he's not getting tackled in that first 10 yards. I don't know. Mm. You tell me what this looks like now. I echo a lot of those sentiments. I mean, this, and we're talking offline, like, this is just something, not just for the Bills, but I think in general football, again, like offenses and defenses, like everything is cyclical, nothing is new. Offense and defense just, they each swing the pendulum and take over, and then the other one just takes the pendulum and swings it back, and you counter and counter and counter and all that kind of stuff. And with, we talked about it a little earlier, like with what defenses are doing now, the Bills, how defense has been playing the Bills is very much like one of the case studies for what's happening like in the modern NFL like again the two high coverage structures nickel defenses lighter boxes like what gaps and fronts you're playing and protecting and what you're trying to take away and then how do you counter that and you have a team like the Chiefs you know every Bills fans favorite team and what they pivoted to the past couple of years in terms of like having their run game and in Mahomes is tremendous and Reed is tremendous and all this but think about and, and I always go back to these examples Think when Mahomes goes out against the Jaguars two seasons ago and and everybody's like, oh my God, what's going to happen? The Chiefs are in the shadow of their own goal line and Chad Henney, I believe is the quarterback, makes like a tremendous throw on a third down. But what they basically do is run the ball down the Jags' throat with Isaiah Pacheco. Same thing in the Super Bowl. Mahomes dings his ankle again. They start out that second half against the Eagles and all they do is run the football. They just yep. run the football, run the football, run the football. And it's a necessary pivot. And again, it's, sometimes it's just it's just plain math. Well, you've got two corners and you've got two safeties back there. Okay, that's already four guys back there. So the most guys can have in the box, a defense can have in the box is seven. One of those seven, even if they do, is probably a nickel corner who's what, 195 pounds at most, maybe, probably 190, like on average. So from a size perspective, you have an advantage there. And you start to look at, again, like the interior defensive line play, how defenses are built and size and frames and all that stuff. And... I just think that's a natural pivot in today's NFL, but especially the Bills. They have a good run game. They have a good offensive line coach. They have a nice complementary group of running backs. They have an offensive line that can dabble in multiple schemes. They have enough movement. They have enough strength. They're not the biggest people-moving team, but they can shepherd and escort some dudes and use leverage to make holes and make plays like that. And that ties into teams taking away the explosives from the Bills and Josh Allen and putting caps on them with two highs and all this stuff and playing all this off coverage, you can attack that in a multitude of ways. Two of the most obvious ones, like, you can go at it harder with, like, more speed. So if teams want to, like, put the cap on you, cool, you can go get Xavier Worthy and just threaten and still try and either get past them and get past the cap or stretch the cap so much that Dalton Kincaid has all this space in the intermediate or Shakir in the intermediate or underneath, whatever. Or you can hit them in the mouth. Yes, and run the football and make them go. All right, we're giving up like six and seven yards of carry. We can't stay with in too high anymore. Yeah. We got to walk a safety down pre snap. And for everybody who talks about like, oh, Keon Coleman, he's slow. Ask, or I, I go back to this. He ran a 
faster 40 time, or at least a similar 40 time to Gabe Davis. I think it was off by 0. 0.3. He seconds. ran a 4.61. They, in embedded, they said 4.57, but I believe his official 40 time was 4.61, and Gabe Davis ran a 4.54. But now, he does not play 4.61. He plays in the mid 4.5s. Now, he's still, to your point, not a burner. Not he's a not, burner. He's not Brian Thomas Jr. But ask me if Levi Wallace thinks that Gabe Davis is slow. Oh, that's a fair point. When 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 Levi Wallace is chasing Gabe Davis down the field on a ninety plus yard touchdown pass, does he think he's slow? I don't know. And, and <laughs> you, you tell me. That's a fair point. Like, and how many? Then you start to look at size and measurables for all the guys that are yeah. covering these dudes for your, in their size and measurables and so on and so forth. Yeah. But it. it so it, in it, a perfect it, world, everyone's like, "Oh, well, these guys are going to struggle to set, get, get separation." In a perfect world. They might. Like, and, like I don't... Sure. We're going to see what happens with Keon Coleman, right? Like, our team's going to press him. Are they going to test his release package? Like, what work sure. can he do and improve? Can he start to separate either at the line or in his stems or in his breaks? But you know what's going to help that is if you just start hitting teams in the mouth with a running game, now your cornerbacks can't come out there. Like, that's the thing. It's like Mike Tyson. Everybody has a plan until you get punched in the face. Fair. You come out there and hit a team early with a good rushing attack, and now their cornerbacks have no choice but to turn their eyes and go, all right, I can't just stick to Keon Coleman. I can't just sit here because if they run it again to my side, I'm responsible for this. I have to fill. Or if you have a single high safety, then it's more one-on-one scenarios that are created on the outside, and then you don't need him to necessarily win early or win declaratively. You you get more of a jump ball and contested catch scenario, which he excels at. Now, I know people will be like, oh, he had a 33.3 <clears throat> contested catch rate in 2023. He had a 62.5 contested catch rate the year before at Michigan State. Scheme and quarterback and throws and timing impacts all of that, and he was significantly impacted by Travis, um, the quarterback for Florida State, and their offensive general, which even though they're Florida State and they were undefeated, was surprisingly muddied and mucky and not great. Not great. That's why, but, they, that's why they got snubbed and everyone yeah, wants to quite foul over it. Now, you don't want to live, have to live on 50-50 balls and contested catches. Like, it's a hard, even if you're good at it, it's hard to win that way consistently, especially in the NFL. But I think this offense is going to funnel through Dalton Kincaid as the number one pass catcher. And tight ends still, if you have a true dual threat tight end, they are the biggest mismatch creator on mm-hmm. the field. There's a reason why... Those Patriot offenses, for as much as it was Brady and Moss and all these dudes, like having Gronk and Aaron Hernandez, who could both block and run routes, teams had no idea how to match up with them. And no. teams, if you have that type, and I'm not saying the Bills do with Kincaid and Knox, but tight ends are the great mismatch creator schematically from an alignment perspective, from a personnel perspective. If you use that and then pair it with a strong run game and more power and marry it with the power spread and still have the threat of Josh Allen's legs, it, it can work again. You have so we we have the ability as a football team to kitchen sink yes. you. We can throw anything we want at another team at any time, and they that hasn't been diminished with the departure of Diggs and, Diggs and Davis. It's just now they're gonna have to do it differently, and they're gonna ha- and honestly, like having a good run game and then generating explosives off of under center play action yes. from it is probably the way they're gonna have to live yes. because even I know what Curtis Samuel's time forty is. I don't think he plays like a 4-3-140 guy. He's no. not just running by everybody left no. and right on the field. You don't have that necessary field-stretching component nope. to your receivers or pass catchers in general. You have some guys who can get vertical and who have some speed, but you're not burning anybody. But at the same time, there's DCs who are going to look at this collect- like Because DCs aren't stupid like fans are. Like They're not us sitting here going... They're not the WGR callers who are just screaming Damn. about the lack of... Yeah, no, dude, those people are idiots. You're mouth breathers. I turn... I turn the radio off when I hear them take a call because you people make me want to bite my steering wheel. I want to sink my teeth into it and just like that's that's the only release that I can find while I'm driving and I hear this crap. The concept that like there's defensive coordinators who are just going to, well, we're going to fill the box and that's how we're going to live. I don't care who you are, and I don't care who your wide receivers are. If you hang single high safety more often than you don't play too high against a Josh Allen-led offense, you will suffer. Now, you might still win a game, but there's going to be detritus. There will be times, like, if, if they can face teams that who can play single high or who have the corners that can match the physicality and still have Miami athleticism might be a speed. team that thinks they have the defensive backs to hold serve and play single high and fill the box. Mm. And they might be right. We're going to find out. But there's not a lot of teams that are built like that. No, you're playing and, odds and percentages. And you and could argue the reason they're built that way is because of Josh Allen. 
Mm. It's a fair point. Yeah, kind of. And I mean, even look at their draft this year, going more pass rushers and pass rushers and yep. pass rushers. And I mean, granted, it's a premium position, so you can kind of play devil's advocate with it. But it, it's going to be an interesting. And I always also wonder how much of like if then or what's the like correlation versus causality here. Like for all we know. I don't know. They really, really wanted like Brian Thomas or they just didn't want to trade up for him. So maybe we're having a different conversation if they get him or something. Or maybe they had a different plan at receiver and free agency and it didn't necessarily work out or what the timeline of the digs, the digs move was. Or maybe I was going to say maybe they wanted a receiver at 60, but from what embedded made it seem, it made it seem like they were almost going to trade up for Cole Bishop. Like they really wanted Cole Bishop in yeah. round two. So maybe that's not even the case. Like, so if, it, some of it is <clears throat> obviously dependent upon how free agency goes and how the board goes and then what you're left with. But I think given the way everything has been constructed, there is a purposeful nature to it. And maybe this seems it, intentional. Yes. That they put a giant, a, a, a not fast wide receiver group yes. full of just mashers together. And maybe it was more reactionary they're the than brothers. proactive. They're the, they're the Bash brothers. It's Good, like yeah. uh, that stupid movie that everyone loves. The Mighty, Ducks. Mighty Ducks. You don't love the Mighty Ducks? Dude, the Flying V is one of the dumbest places. Oh, absolutely. The history. Flying V is super dumb. But the second Mighty Ducks slaps, man. They defeat Iceland in the finals, even though like the movie was too scared to call them Russia, which is basically what they were. Yes. Oh, man. Iceland. Wolf the Dennis Stanson is such a menacing coach. He's wearing all black, and he tells Gunner at the end, you lost it for me, Gunner. And then Gunner's like, you lost it for yourself. Man, sun's <laughs> right there on the ice in front of everybody. I also love, I hate Face. that. I hate that, man, twice for you. What is going on, guy? That beer sat there for a half hour and exploded. That was a Chris, booby what trap. what did you do? I don't know that what I did there. That planned. I definitely don't like how in the second Mighty Ducks... They let Bombay coach it, and they, he basically just gets to fill the team with his Mighty Ducks kids and then pick, like, three random people for the oh, rest yeah. of the country. It's like oh, Kenny Wu, the kid from Sandlot who, who can't, can't stop. stop. Yeah. Benny the Jet Rodriguez. Yes, that's Benny the Jet who's double sporting it and nobody's talking. Like, it's just like, oh, yeah, use your regular team. You have access to the best hockey players in the whole country. And you you're, just picked the yeah, Mighty Ducks. You're only picking these nine kids from Minnesota. Like, I get they make good hockey Although players. I'm not but, gonna, I was going to say, I'm not going to lie, they did a graphic, and they were like, Here's the here's like a heat map of the U.S. and Canada, and here's where all of the current NHL players Everybody's come from. from Minnesota, and it's a belt line that runs basically the. If you took, if you go take the U.S. Canadian border and you go out maybe fifty miles in either direction, it's just a beltway. <laughs> it's like <laughs> that's, that's, that's where fair. all of the NHL that's talents fair. come from. That's fair. That's understandable. So maybe I take it back a little bit, but that's a classic. I can't believe you don't. I don't watch the first one as much, and the third one is stupid. Don't even bring me... No, no. You the know private makes, school one is ridiculous. You know what makes D3 unbelievable? I actually had this out with E.J. Snyder. What bugs me about that movie, and it's one scene that makes the whole thing un... Like, I, my suspension of disbelief breaks, and I, I turn it off. Pacey from Dawson's Creek is sitting there listening to his earphones. Yeah, Charlie Conway. I can't yeah. believe you called him Pacey. <laughs> and he's sitting there... And this girl plops down next to him, and she's like, oh, what are you listening to? And he's like, oh, Pantera. And she's like, oh, yeah, so, no, uh, I'm into Pantera, too. The fuck you are? You mean, oh, yeah. You don't you think mean, she's blasting respect on her way to class? You're, you're, dun, 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 well, and walk. she's just walking. Oh, there walk, you go, walk, first walk. Sorry, sorry. Also. Rob Van Dam theme song, ECW, uh, like, shout like, out. Okay, <laughs> yeah, you know those. Uh, how about By Demons Be Driven? Yeah, she's listening to that. Uh, uh. Maybe she's a private school kid who's like really dark, like that. that Slaughtered. Trope. She's listening to. Uh, it, I don't. I, uh, Maybe that's what, her jam. Maybe she's playing Metallica. Like Death on the Rattle. Walk away. This. I don't know enough. Drag Pantera the songs. waters. Like she, you. I need think to you're tell making me songs that up This now. broad is at home. I say broad, and there's a bunch of people watching this <laughs> who are gonna just immediately get mad at me. I want to walk this back. You mean to tell oh, me? Oh, walk like this, Pantera. Nice. This young woman. <laughs> Very nice prep school girl is at home blasting like some of like some of the rougher metal that exists. Yeah, I don't believe it. This whole movie is a farce. I can't believe that's what you're hanging your head on. That's the part of the movie that I find the most unbelievable thing ever. I don't. I was always that. waiting for D four the plane crash where they go <sighs> over to Europe to play uh, and they uh, the plane goes down in the Atlantic. And it's an only an hour long movie. It actually turns out it's 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 actually open water. Like it's, Damn, it's, that got it's, real dark. No, I was thinking it's a positive. They like crash land on some like random island that's run by like a militia, and, and they, they have, have to, to play. They have to beat him in hockey survival. to free the island. Like how in D two they go and play hockey in like the center of Compton, and everybody's all like loving it. 
That's it, I want is, that. They have to free the island from this evil militia who and the militia is all about street hockey and that's all they play every day. And so Charlie Conway and the rest of the D4 squad got to see. I actually saw it floated that they were like, this is how war should be settled from now on. Instead of instead of drone strikes and all this crap that we're doing now. Here's what we do. If we, the U.S., really have a score to settle. We give them a year and we say, listen, assemble your squad. Here's some tapes. Watch them. Learn American football. We'll play. Oh, that's your, funny. your best against our best. Because it would play out. The, like the- <laughs> They would kill. We would destroy everybody. <laughs> and then place freedom upon the world with through sport. What? Through sport. <laughs> freedom. All right. There's a lot of people who are going to get mad at me. Dude, we've, we've upset everybody, I think, now. We've upset uh, females. We've upset those who believe that the U.S. is constantly correct. Well, the, the, also, the there's a strong, like, Mighty Duck fan contingent. I feel like you're going to get a lot of backlash on that one. My wife. My wife, like, went to a Halloween party in college as Mrs. Uh, Mrs. Uh, Conway. Her passwords are all Mighty Ducks related. Like, she That's is awesome. a fan. So when I tell her that I shit all over the movies. Oh, my God. But you don't even like the second one? No, oh. the first one, first one or nothing, and even that one, the flying V is As the, the only thing I've ever is seen. the only person in in the room that plays hockey on the reg. I played street hockey. Oh, on the reg. Sorry, <laughs> all three of them are shit. Well, yeah, the hockey is not good. Yes, that's what I'm. But wh- at. Wh- what's what sport movie has like good choreographed sports? It's hard. White men can't jump is phenomenal for like White basketball. White men can't jump might be Love it. so. So Greg, Mike Camarangelo. Oh yeah, and Greg. Uh, uh, I don't know if any of you and have I seen did the it, movie did the Greg Ready Johnson? to Rumble. Oh, no, yeah. No, honestly, I'll I love Black, Ready to Rumble. I will rule you. I will you. rule you. <laughs> it's one of the dumbest films Jimmy ever. King is the best wrestler. He's the bestler. Better yeah. than all the wrestler. <laughs> it's... What is he? Well, what is he when he's a cop wrestler and he comes on the motorbike? Yeah, because like, his dad's a sheriff. You. I will bust you. Yeah, that's right. This thing, it's so stupid. It's awful, but it's but and they I give watched. David Arquette in real WCW gave David Arquette the, the belt. They made him the champion in like real life. And I'm not gonna lie to you, I watched that movie on my birthday with my cousin and two of my best friends, and then I proceeded to buy the DVD. That's and right. I own it, and I still watch Ready to Rumble anytime it's on. Because you're a man of taste and culture, and that movie is taste and culture. Last idea before we let you go, before we wrap this thing up, Javon Solomon. Oh. I mean, whenever I say the word archetype, mm-hmm. people are like, wow, I'm surprised Drew knows what that word is. Maybe WCW may- comp Ernest Miller. <laughs> wow, tremendous. <laughs> I, hate you I was thinking Norman Smiley. The oh, length. Yeah. The length. And the wiggle. I'm yeah. going to Oliver Plant <laughs> yeah. axe handle smash you off this table. Nice reference. Um, That's what his finisher is. I know. The crown. The crown. Crown him. The crown that guy. I love that movie. Damn it. <laughs> See, you're a wrestling guy at heart. I like that. I am. Don't run, listen, part. listen to your heart when it's Dude, calling I, for you. If I hear listen the glass heart. break, I'll flip this That's table. That's right. I'll, I'll, I'll flip this table and clothesline him like uh, like I was one of the acolytes. Next, Wow. J- JBL. Yeah. Bradshaw. Yeah, clothesline from hell. So. Wrestling guy. When I say archetype, people think I'm a caveman who didn't get a 1270 on my SAT. Now. You got a 1270? What's funny what is. What was it out of 3100? <laughs> I don't even know what that is. I don't know. I don't, even, yeah, I don't even know what it's at. But what I do know is my brother <laughs> scored like 10 points less than me, and he was furious about it. That makes sense. I remember. And then so then like there would be times where he and I would be arguing about things. Now, this is a kid who went to pharmacy school. Nice. And we'd be having an argument, and I'd be like, I got a this is actually how it is. But I can understand how you would see it that way, being a guy who got a 12 60. That's awesome. I love that. And it was, Sorry you can't comprehend it. Sorry you can't comprehend it. 12 60. Because it was literally the only academic thing I ever had over That's it. That's huge. That's a huge one, though. But all it is is I, I'm i sure I crushed, because I, I failed math, too. Couldn't do geometric mm. proof. Yeah, but that, that's like like he won all these individual like season awards and MVPs and offensive player, and then you're like, oh, I, I have a Super Bowl, Bowl ring. Yeah. I won the Super Bowl that's ring. That's right. But it was just funny. Like, I failed math, too. Never took trig. Um... But I must have crushed the reading comprehension. <laughs> mm. That had to be it. It's, it's a moneymaker. But either way, the Bills archetype at defensive end, always these big, crushing the pocket, yes. physical defensive ends. This guy doesn't seem to fit that mold, and yet he has a lot of productivity. He's got a lot of speed, athleticism. Yes. So the question is, I want to ask you, do you see a world where they take this kid and say, we could try to square peg round hole this and then wring our hands later that it didn't work? Or what we could do is 
try to do what A.J. Klein should have been, which is a guy who is a Sam linebacker who plays near the line of scrimmage most of the time. Mm. With that athleticism, his range, the, the stuff that he has positively, do you see a world where he maybe almost makes the roster as a linebacker more so than a defensive end over the next two years? I think he makes it as an edge. Okay. The signing of Dewan Smoot, even though it's only like a one-year deal, I find really intriguing because he was a very effective player for Jacksonville in, up until he tore his Achilles in Week 16 of 2022, and then he spent 2023 trying to like work his way back. I really, prior to that, again, he muddies the waters a little bit. I thought Solomon had a legit chance to win like the edge four or edge five job, like going into camp before Smoot. He has he has a legitimate like pass rush productivity and plan and move set like coming off the edge. What's funny is, and you talk about it like, he, so he ticks like the arm length box for the Bills. Like that's an archetype. They love that. But there, and I have these numbers off the top of my head. Traditionally, what they've gone for in the draft at edge, <clears throat> so you think of like Basham, Epinesa, Groot, their average height is six foot five. Their average weight is 272 pounds. I was going to say, like, when you look, he's a weird draft pick because he's barely bigger than our current off ball linebacker. Yeah. Uh, he's, six, he's almost six one, two hundred 246 pounds. Meanwhile, like, 276, what is it, defensive end drafted fifth round or later? 276 have been drafted fifth or later. There's only 12 by my count that have been useful at the NFL level. Uh. Six were great, and it was Yannick Ngakwe, Mathis, Judon, Hardy, Sealer, and Adelius Thomas. Robert Mathis was a fifth round of the Robert draft? Robert Mathis. Good call. I didn't know that. Six were average, and that's but they were mostly 3-4 defensive ends. Which is that much uh, different. Five techs. Yeah. It's a whole different body yeah, style. Different world. Brett Kiesel, uh, Charles Omenihu, oh. those types of guys. Dude, dudes that are, you can be more of a grinder and not have to be as clean and pretty. Yes. And then there's a couple famous UDFAs like uh, Wake, Harrison, Barnett, mm. uh, Barrett, all mm. bigger players. Mm -hmm. So this guy strikes me as a guy who probably won't live in the trenches just because of his size. I think he's going to be more of <clears> – <throat> and, and you watch him on tape. What's also interesting too, like they have him at Troy – and then in an odd front at times. So he's playing a four eye a bunch, which is the inside shoulder of a tackle, which he's not. It doesn't lend to his size and frame. It makes his life harder. And so when you watch him get kicked outside is where he can win more. I think he's going to be more of a more of a true pass rush specialist. Like he's a dude you're going to see more on third down. He tries against the run like he. One of the so big if you ran a four three over and ran a ran a Sam linebacker in there instead of a. Nick, son of a nickel guy. Yeah. No, I'm I would I'm putting I'm putting Solomon on the field on third down, like right at edge, and I'm lighting him lining him up in like a wide technique, and I am like letting him. Yeah. Okay. Maybe even like a little, maybe even reduce him a little more. And I'm it's not, now because in going to the archetype piece, like he's got moves, like he's got a cross chop. He un, he, like, he can rip. He understands leveraging. He has a long arm. He can transition. He can counter. Like he has plan. He has moves. He can test the waters and test the cage early, and then capitalize later. But with that size and frame, he doesn't go through dudes like straight through their chest a bunch. No. He also doesn't have an inside move a ton. Um, because he's smaller. Correct. If you pass him off to a guard, he's going to get mauled. So when he wins, he's winning with juice and speed off the edge, or he's able to turn that corner, win that half-man relationship, and then he's got tremendous core strength. He can lean in and turn that corner and rip. And even though like bigger tackles are trying to push him out, he's still flattening down the line to the QB. So he's got to add a little bit, I think, more of a diverse package and able to be being able to go more speed to power and go through a dude or go inside. But from a moves perspective and an understanding of how to rush the quarterback, he's legitimate. It's just he's a bit smaller and he's going to be impacted in other ways. And so the reason I ask that is because my just last thing before we wash our hands this whole draft pick and roster construction conversation, or at least for a little while. I just think that if they put him more in the mold of an outside linebacker, pass rusher, occasionally going to see the field and let him develop over the next year or two, it could be the A.J. Epinesa curve where it's by year three, year four, you're watching him develop into the player that you want. And you're talking to like four, three outside linebacker where you're going like to yeah. drop him into coverage and stuff? No, 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 no. And purely I'm, well, on the line. Purely at the line. Yeah, like, so I'm thinking A.J. Klein against the Seahawks, that game where he had a monster game, two sets. Oh, fumble. gotcha. But he's a linebacker. Yeah. But you're going to bring him in against a team you know is going to try to throw the ball, and yet he had a monster game for you. He was super productive huh. because his pass rush acumen was better than the guys who were going to be able to block him because our DNs occupied the tackles. Yeah. That's how you can win with a guy like that. Yeah. I feel like he's a chess piece that you can deploy here and there, 
that can win you certain matchups. He's a really interesting piece. I didn't it's think... It's not going to be an every down player, <clears throat> but he no. can be a guy who occasionally he could be your trump card in a given set. I really didn't think he would be on their radar because of his size. Like, the, the length checks out, but I didn't think he would be on their radar. Which is why he's not part of their... That's why it was a surprise. But also true, like... To the point, new defensive line coach, new defensive coordinator, maybe there's a new mold or a new consideration here. Maybe it's not necessarily about, you know, size and frame and pocket compression. Is there a new defensive coordinator, though? I don't know. I don't know. Guys, this conversation has been really fun. We could do this all night, but we got to get out of here because we have a live show to record. This has been a lot of fun. Thank you for coming in here, doing all this. Having this heavy analytical conversation with me because I'm kind of just an ape with beer. Um, who spills it guys everywhere. drew gear chris krueger anthony where can people follow you on twitter at pro underscore underscore ant that's pro two underscores a n t what nights can they find you live on youtube find me hosting my solo show called disguised coverage every tuesday 9 p.m eastern and then i'm the co-host of the cover one film room live every wednesday 7 p.m eastern and i'm actually going to be putting out a video of some film breakdown on javon solomon coming out in the next couple days ironically so that's funny bang and there we go guys this has been a lot of fun but we're gonna get the hell out of here i'm drew gear that's chris krueger that's anthony prohaska this has been your rock pop report